morning. Man, I'm so excited to be here this morning. I'm Will Bray. I am the campus pastor at Upstate Church Anderson, uh, not too far away. And I'm just so excited to be here at Upstate Church. Five Forks, glad to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I will say there's kind of a little running joke with the teaching team. It's always intimidating to come and preach at Five Forks because none of us are anywhere close to as funny as Dustin. And so he's the funniest of us. Someone literally just said that's true on this side of the room. I'm not looking over there. But, but he, uh, he is funnier than the rest of us. And so this is what you need to know. I will take it personally if you don't laugh at my jokes, all right? It will hurt my feelings, and so you just have to know that you've got to be okay with my self-worth if you don't laugh at my jokes, all right? You just got to be okay holding that in your hands. On that note, all right, we're going to try a little experiment. I'm going to put some pressure on you. It went pretty well in the first service, all right? And so if it doesn't go well, I'm going to take it on. It's going to be your fault, all right? It's not going to be my fault. It's not going to be Dustin's fault. It's going to be your fault if this doesn't go well, all right? But what we're going to do is I'm going to, I don't sing, all right? So I'm not like, this isn't me trying to sing in front of you guys or whatever, but I'm just going to sing like a little bit of a line of a song and I need you to finish it, all right? We're going to do it twice. I need some confirmation that everybody understands what I'm saying, all right? Anybody with me today? Just the people in the front row. Anybody know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. I'm just, they're very popular songs. You're going to know them. I'm going to sing a little bit and then you're going to finish it for me. I think together we'll kind of understand what I'm trying to do. Everybody good? All right, pretty good. All right, this is how we're going. We're going to start with one I think we should all know, okay? Uh, I really hope that you do. Okay, all right. Whoa, we're halfway there. Great job, guys. That was awesome. Some of you didn't do it, all right? And I'm going to be looking at you during this next one, all right? I'm, I'm, all right? You, you can look at me like I'm an idiot for the next 30 minutes, but it's just going to hurt my feelings, all right? So we're going to try one more, okay? I think you should know it. Rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, and you feel. Great job. You guys are killing it. All right, experts in 80s rock music and mid-2000s country music. All right, that's pretty good. All right, not too bad. You may say, all right, you've proved that you're not as funny as Dustin. Why did we start that way? Like, what are we trying to do? All right, this is why I started that way. All right, I know it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit different. You had to hear me sing and all that. But this is why I did that, all right? Because this morning we're going to dive into a passage of scripture that is Moses leading the people of Israel in a song of praise. And what I want to show you just for a second is that there's power in, in a song, right? Uh, some of you, you might can even think back to the first time that you heard living on a prayer, all right? I'm not trying to make anybody feel old in here, but that song was written 12 years before I was born, all right? So... <laughs> That says more about me being young than you being old, okay? It's all right. It's not a big deal. But, but maybe you were just like transported back in time. You can remember the first time you ever heard that song or a song like it. For me, when I think about Wagon Wheel, it's like I can see myself sitting around a campfire with my friends my freshman year of college. Or just a little fun fact, the student coordinator here, Brandon Shiley, he says he plays the guitar, but he can only play one song on the guitar, and that's Wagon Wheel, all right? And so when I hear that song, I think about like being in the living room, and we can only sing Wagon Wheel because Brandon has the guitar, right? <laughs> Like, I, I don't know about you, but you think about songs that mean something to you. They make you feel something. They take you back in time. They help you remember something that happened. You go through an experience or you feel something that maybe music can actually express in a deeper and a more real way than kind of anything else. And the truth is we experience that with our corporate worship as well, right? Like you think about even just now as we worship God in song together, there are some, there's kind of a level of intimacy of closeness with God that you experience in worshiping in song that you don't in any other way, right? That we can express ourselves to God through our praise in a way maybe we can't uh, in other ways. And so as we think about praise, as we think about worship this morning, as we even read a passage of scripture that is kind of an example of that praise in song, we want to kind of think about what praise is for a second. Sometimes praise is that kind of corporate worship that we've even just experienced. But oftentimes praising God is as simple as reminding ourselves of things that we know to be true, stating as fact things that we have to believe in faith and saying, I believe that with all of my heart. Sometimes praise is calling ourselves to believe things that we know to be true, reminding ourselves that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. So regardless of the circumstance of our praise, regardless of the method of our praise, really what we're going to try to dig into this morning is the content 
of our praise, the content of our worship. What do we express to God when we praise him? Maybe in song, maybe in declaration of faith, but when we praise God, what's the content of our praise? And I'm just gonna kind of give you two categories to think about as we read our passage of scripture this morning. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, we're gonna read a good bit of text, all right? And so while we're reading that, I wanna give you two categories to kind of hang everything we read on, to kind of give you a, a place to hold on to, something to be thinking about as we step through this passage of scripture. First of all, we praise God because of who he is. We'll talk about that with a little more clarity in a minute, but we praise God because of who he is. So as we read this passage of scripture, Think about, see the ways that Moses leads the people of Israel to praise God because of his character, because of who he is. But secondly, we praise God because of what he has done. And so as we read this passage of scripture where Moses leads the people of Israel to praise God, see the ways that he praises God, that they praise God, not only for who he is and his character, but also for what he has done. So read with me beginning in Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. It'll be on the screen. You can pull out your phone or your Bible if you've got it. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, just to give us a little context before we jump in, just to remind you what's been happening. The people of Israel have been in slavery in Egypt for generations. They, God has promised to deliver them. He actually does it. He comes through on his promise. He delivers them out of the land of their slavery and oppression in Egypt. He walks them through the desert, leads them as a, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, all the way up into the Red Sea, and they get to the Sea of Impossibility, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But they stand with an impassable sea on one side and all of Pharaoh's armies on the other And yet God miraculously does the impossible. He parts the Red Sea. The people of Israel walk through on dry land. And what we're about to read is their response of praise. Uh, Over the last couple of months, we've dug into what God has done for the people of Israel in the book of Exodus. And what we're about to read is their response to what God has done. And I think we can learn something about our response of praise through it. So Exodus chapter 15, verse one, the Bible says, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. If you highlight or underline or take notes, highlight that verse. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deep congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But you blew your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like the Lord? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Verse 20, drop down with me to verse 20 very quickly. Then Miriam the prophetess and the the sister of Aaron took the tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. Tambourines and dancing and Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. 
So as we see this example of worship, as we see this song of praise that Moses wrote and led the people of Israel in, what can we learn from it? How, how can we learn to praise God, to respond to him in worship as we read this passage of scripture? What do we say about God? What is the content of our praise? First of all, Moses shows us that God is exactly who he said he was. God is exactly who he said he was. The first way that we see that is in verse two, Moses says, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. Pretty clearly, pretty, uh, pretty on the surface, this means probably what you think it means, right? Moses is saying, there are things for which I do not have the strength. There are circumstances in my life that I do not have the power to get through, and God is my strength. God gives me strength when I have none. It means that I know that I can't live this life in my own power. It means that I know that the Lord is the one holding me up and holding me fast. But this is also a statement of exclusivity. It means that if God is my strength, then nothing else is. It means that I know that when I have no strength left, I'm not looking to any other source for my strength. When I feel I can't go anymore, I'm not looking to anything else to get me through. But the Lord is my strength. See, we live in a culture, and unfortunately, even a Christian culture many times, that will tell you that you have the power within to get through what you're going through, that you have hope within you, that you have strength within you that will get you through the circumstances of your life, but that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Moses is saying here. He's saying, I don't have the strength to get through it, but praise be to God, the Lord is my strength, that God can provide the strength for me to get through the circumstances I can't get through on my own. God can provide the hope for me in a circumstance that seems hopeless. God can take what seems broken and impossible and breathe life into it. So how do we see that Moses can see God as his strength? How do the people of Israel see God as their strength? I just want you to put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Just imagine how they must have felt. For weeks, we've been talking about what the people of Israel have gone through, but they had to have been weary from their journey. Not only had they been through generations of bondage, talk, I mean, the, the weariness and the, and the despair that they must have felt as a people, but also now as they've left the, the land of Egypt, physically and emotionally, how weary and broken they must be to have gone through the Egyptian desert, then to have stood before a sea feeling trapped, thinking they were hopeless in despair. There must have been no way through. God delivers them through what seems impossible, and they get out on the other side. And, and this song we just read is their experience. We actually even have a little bit of a picture of how weary they must have felt. Uh, I, I love this verse. I, I mentioned it at, at Anderson campus last week. I think this is hilarious. It has to be the most dramatic sentence in the entire Bible. God has delivered them from bondage in Egypt and they get out to the wilderness and they say to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to die? I'm not an expert. This, is, this isn't in the Bible, but that had to be a teenage girl who said that, right? Like, that level of drama of sash, like an adult shouldn't speak that way. You know what I'm saying? Like the people of Israel were so fed up, they let a 14-year-old girl speak for them. That's what, that's what that verse is, right? Like, did you bring us out here to die because there weren't any graves in Egypt? Like, can we give Moses a break? Like, goodness gracious. Like, you just got delivered from generations of slavery in Egypt. God's been pretty good, I would say. And they're tired. They're fed up. They're weary. All right, they, they're kind of at their end, all right? And, and they stand, before God delivers them, they stand at this impossibility and, and they just think there's nothing that they can do to go on. Maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe you feel just like the people of Israel did. You feel like God has abandoned you. Maybe you feel like the circumstances of your life are hopeless. Like there's no way for you to keep going. Maybe you're weary from the journey. It's been a long season of life for you. Maybe it's a problem at home. Maybe it's a problem at work. Maybe life's just been tough. 
maybe because of COVID and, and everything that's been going on over the last few years, you just feel wore down. You feel like you don't know if you have the strength to carry on. That's exactly where Moses and the people of Israel find themselves. But what we just read is that Moses makes it clear. He, he can stand in faith, in worship, and in praise and say, the Lord is my strength. Even when we were weary, the Lord was my strength. Even when we were in slavery, the Lord was our strength. When we didn't think we had the will to go on, the Lord was our strength. And Moses can say, now that we're on the other side of victory, we can continue to stand in victory and say, the Lord is our strength. And so regardless of what you're going through, maybe you feel today like the, the people of Israel, you're standing in front of a sea of impossibility. Today, you can say, the Lord is my strength. Regardless of my circumstances, the Lord is my strength. Even when I feel that I have no power to go on, the Lord is my strength. Even when that addiction or that struggle with sin seems like it's gotten the best of me, I know that the Lord is my strength. The truth is, is that the Lord will be your strength when you have none left. The Lord will make your path straight. The truth is that you are never walking alone. You were never holding yourself up. It was always God's mighty right hand holding you up. The psalmist in Psalm 18 says, even when I thought my foot was slipping, he said it's in that moment that I realized it was God holding me up the entire time. And maybe that's the truth that God needs to speak to you this morning. That in a circumstance where you feel like your feet are slipping, where you feel like you cannot continue to go on, you feel hopeless or in despair, today God is saying to you that it was his right hand that was holding you up the entire time and that the Lord will be your strength. So this song of praise, the content of our praise and our worship can first say, I, I know who God is, that he is exactly who he said he was, and that the first way we see that is that the Lord can be our strength. But secondly, we see that the Lord is our song. Moses says, the Lord is my song. I think on the surface, this isn't quite as clear what this might mean as the Lord is my strength. But the idea here ultimately is that it means that God is the source of my joy. He's the source of my singing. He's my reason to praise. When Moses says, the Lord is my song, it's almost like he's saying something like, I just can't help myself, right? I have a reason to praise. I have a reason to sing, and I just can't help myself but to express it. The Lord is my song. The Lord is my joy. He's the reason I sing. This is how that makes sense to me. We are creatures of self-expression. You and I, it's just how we were created. I, I think you've probably experienced this in your own life. Sometimes you found yourself saying things out loud that you were like, I shouldn't have expressed that. Like, uh, like I should have kept that to myself, but here I go, right? Running my mouth and I don't know why. Here's just a kind of a, a funny little example from my own life. A few weeks ago, I was cutting my grass and I feel like my dad has prepared me pretty well for my life. Like I, for the most part, like I, you know, I know how to cut the grass. Like I can handle some of that stuff, right? I feel decently prepared, but evidently he forgot to tell me that yellow jackets can live in the ground. I don't know how that slipped all right, in 24 years, but nobody told me that, all right? No one told me I was supposed to be deathly afraid of running them over while I was cutting my grass, all right? But unknowingly to me, I ran over a, a nest. They had, I don't know, dug their heels in somewhere in my, in my yard. And so I ran over them without knowing it. I'm, I got my headphones in, you know, listening to my audio book, doing my thing, living my best life. I turned the corner, right? I come back into the war zone that I did not know existed, right? And although intellectually, I knew why your lawnmower, I have a push mower because I'm not rich like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and even though I knew intellectually that when you let go of it, it turns off because, you know, people could, it could go wrong. I'd never experienced why that happens to such a degree because I threw my lawnmower into like the next yard. You know what I'm saying? Like when that yellow jacket, like, I don't know, felt like ate a chunk out of my leg. Like I just threw my, my lawnmower and now I know why it turns off, you know, when you let go. Okay. Over the next few days, I found myself telling everyone I talked to that I had been stung by a yellow jacket. Why would I do that, right? Like, number one, 
no one cares that I got stung by a yellow jacket, right? Like that is not interesting information. Like that no one want like that every time they were like, oh, how about that? Okay, like no one wants to talk about that. You know what I'm saying? And number two, it's a negative experience. Why do I want to share that? Like, why would I bring that up? Why would I talk about that? It didn't feel good. You know what I mean? Like it was negative. We do that. We just talk about the things that we experience because we are creatures of self-expression. It's part of how we're hardwired. We want to share our experiences with other people. When something has impacted us, especially on an emotional level, we have this almost obligation just in our nature to express it with people. And that's what makes it so inexcusable, so difficult to understand that those of us who have experienced God, who know how good he is to us, who've experienced the redemption and deliverance that the people of Israel have experienced here. It's why it makes no sense that we would stay quiet about it. It's why it makes no sense that I would hold back from singing the song of my salvation to everyone I encounter. If I can tell people about getting stung by a yellow jacket, how is it possible that I would hold back from expressing the goodness of God in my life to the people around me? How is it possible that the people in my neighborhood might could know that I was stung by a yellow jacket but not known how good, is God, good God has been to me? That doesn't seem possible. It doesn't seem possible that we who are obligated almost to self-express would stay quiet about how good God has been to us, about how God has changed our lives, about how he got us through when we didn't know there was any way. This is why that's so important because the people who live in your neighborhood the people who you work with, the people who you interact with on a daily basis, they, like you, are going through things in their life that they cannot get through on their own. They are experiencing circumstances that have zapped their willingness to keep going. They're standing at scenes of impossibility in their life too. They're experiencing things they can't get through on their own. And when we do not sing the song of our praise uh, across everybody in our lives, that we are robbing them of the only strength they can have to get through what they're going through. We're robbing them of the only hope they can ever have that will keep them through their season of despair. We're robbing them of the only salvation they can experience from their sin. And so God would have us like the people of Israel, like Moses, to sing the song of our praise, to share the experience of what God has done for us. That because we know it's true that God is exactly who he said he was, that he would become our strength in the battle and he would become our song to share what God has done to us, done for us and share who God is to us with everyone we encounter. So what? of our praise? How do we share our praise? How do, what, what, what actually makes up our worship? First of all, Moses reminds us that God is exactly who he said he was, that when we worship God, when we praise God, we praise him for his character, for who he is. But secondly, we praise God because God did exactly what he said he was going to do. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. It's true that you can trust God because of his character. That, that's true and it's important. But God doesn't just talk the talk, right? God doesn't just say things. He doesn't just say he is good. He doesn't just say that he is hope. He doesn't just say that he is love. But God actually backs up what he says is true. We're gonna walk through this pretty quickly because it's kind of a recap, but I just wanna show you a way that God said something that was true to the people of Israel and the way that Moses is praising him for backing it up. Because I actually think that it can unlock for us kind of a rhythm of praise in our own lives. Uh, what did God say he was gonna do and actually follow through with for the people of Israel? First of all, he told them that he would deliver them, that he would deliver his people. You don't have to flip there, just really quickly. Exodus 6, verse 6, God said to Moses, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And so I'm just gonna really quickly kind of pick out a little bit from verses four and six in the chapter 15 that we just read to show you how Moses 
actually praises God for exactly what he said he was going to do. He says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. The floods covered them. They were thrown into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O God, glorious in power, your right hand shatters the enemy. When Moses is praising God for what he has done, he looks back to what God promised that he would do, and he says, you did it every time. You came through on your promises. You did exactly what you said you were going to do. Moses remembers that God said he would deliver his people, and then he praises him for following through on his promise. So what I want you to see here is that this is not only praise for God delivering his people. His actions were praiseworthy enough, right? But this is the people of Israel praising God for doing what he said he was going to do. This is the people of Israel finding out with their experience that God always comes through on his promises. This was faith realized. It was promises made and promises kept. And in this, the people of Israel saw clearly that God would always do what he said he was going to do. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us about the deliverance that God has promised us. He did not only promise his people back in the book of Exodus that he would deliver them, but God has made a promise of deliverance to you as well. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ Jesus. And he says, it's by grace that you have been saved. See, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us were dead in our sin, that we were incapable of being made right with God. We were in desperate need of deliverance from our slavery to sin that we could not make ourselves right with God, that we could not be in right relationship with God because of our sin, but that thanks be to God, he stepped into our impossibility and that he made us right with him, that he gave us life where we could not experience it on our own, that he delivered us when there was no way. God makes it clear that even though we were dead in our sin, and even though we needed someone to deliver us from our sin, that Jesus stepped in to our impossibility and he delivered us when there was no other way. That Jesus being rich in mercy and with all the love that he has for you and for me, he reached down into our mess and he made us alive in Christ. That even though you needed deliverance, just like the people of Israel, that God did not leave you there, but he made a way for you when there was no way. So that God made this promise of deliverance to the people of Israel and to you and me, and he kept it. And that God has also promised to the people of Israel and a promise he's made to us that he can do the impossible. And this is how it happens with the people of Israel. There is a sea of impossibility in front of them, and God makes a way where there was no way. And today, regardless of what you're experiencing, maybe you feel like you are standing at an impossibility. You feel like there's something you're going through that you cannot get through, a need that you have that you know you're incapable of fulfilling. Maybe you feel like you're staring at the impossible in your life, we serve a God who makes a way where there is no way. We serve a God who can do and accomplish the impossible, that which we cannot do on our own. And more than anything, regardless of what you're going through, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've brought into this room this morning, each of us were standing at an impossibility in our sin. We had no way of being made right with God. We had no way of spending eternity with him. We were going to pay the payment for our sin, which Romans tells us clearly is death, eternal death in a place called hell. And that even though we were standing at an impossibility, Jesus made for us a way where there was no way. That each of us have experienced this grace and this mercy from our Savior. That even though new life was impossible, when we could have never breathed new life into our own bodies, even though because we were dead in our sin, we could do nothing about our circumstance, God was rich in mercy. He was full of love. 
And the same God who split the Red Sea can save your soul. And so you may be saying, all right, that, that's all well and good. I, I understand um, God should get my praise for who he is and for what he's done. I, I understand that. But what, what does that have to do with my actual life? What does it have to do with, with my everyday life that, God, uh, it, it, that, that those things are true about God? It means that for us, just like Moses, we have only one response. If it's true that God is exactly who he has said he is, and it's true that God has done exactly what he said he would do, if those things are true, then our only right response is to give him the praise and the worship that he is due. God is worthy of more than a Sunday morning. God is worthy of more than just my job or, uh, or some of the relationships in my life. See, true worship, true praise is God getting everything that we have. It's God getting all of us. It, true worship, true praise is God getting every fiber of my being. And so this morning, I just want to ask you a question. If it's true that God is the one worthy of all of our praise, of all of our worship, then what has your worship? What has your praise? What has your attention? What has your affection? What has been distracting you? What has your devotion? What do you spend your time on? What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your energy on? What has your worship? What has your praise? God will not settle for second place. God won't take part of us. See, if we're gonna give God the praise and the worship that he deserves, it's gonna take the, the sum of all that we have. It's gonna take everything we possess. That the worship and praise God deserves would be us giving everything that we have. And so if you're here today and you would just say, you know what, I know the Lord isn't my strength. The Lord isn't my song. He's not my source of life. He isn't my reason for living. He, I've been trying to get through it on my own. I've been trying to go my own way, do my own thing. I, I've, I've been trying to live on my own strength. I've been looking to other things for life and for satisfaction. If that's you today, the Lord can be your strength today. Even now, you can put a flag in the ground and say, today will be the day that I'll make Jesus the Lord of my life that I'll begin a relationship with him in faith, that, that I will make him my strength and my song. But maybe today you would say, I know I have a relationship with Jesus, but I, I feel like I'm standing at that sea of impossibility. I feel like I'm hopeless. I feel like I'm in despair. I feel like I'm in a place where there is no way. Today, would you just respond to God in the only way that we can? Would you say, God, I know that you can make a way where there is no way? God, I know that you are worthy of my praise and you're worthy of my song and you're worthy of my worship regardless of my circumstances. I know that you always come through. I know that you always make good on your promises. I know that you are always the good and just and loving God that you claim to be. And so God, in the midst of my storm, in the midst of my impossibility, in the midst of my circumstances, you're gonna get the praise that you deserve. Today, you can stand in the midst of whatever you're facing and trust that Jesus is exactly who he says he is and that he'll always do exactly what he says he'll do. Even now, if we respond corporately, I pray that we'd give him the worship and the praise that he deserves. Let's pray. God, we believe that you're worthy of everything we have. You're worthy of all of it, God. And so we pray, God, I pray earnestly now that you would help us to drop the things that would hold us back. God, the things that have our attention and our affection, the things that have distracted us from seeing you, God, would you help us to cut those things out of our lives so that we can see you for who you really are. We can trust that you'll always be who you say you'll be and that you'll always come through on your promises. God, I pray for the person who feels lost in despair, who feels hopeless in this room right now. God, would you give them a peace that passes all understanding God, even now, would you begin to flood their heart with hope? Be not because of strength that they have, God, but because they put their faith in you and you were their strength when they had none. God, if there's anyone in this room this morning who doesn't have a relationship with you, God, who's been looking for strength and song and something else, God, I pray they'd find their faith in you this morning. Whether it's meeting a, a minister in the back or filling out a connect card or talking to Dustin out in the lobby, God, I pray that you would help people to take that step of giving you the worship 
and the praise that you're worthy of. God, we love you. We thank you for this time we've had together to be able to worship you. In your name I pray, amen.